Boom! Hey. Hey, dude. I'm Thundercloud. Here, with two sets of glasses at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Washing away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rains. It's chillin' Tuesday. Yeah, you know, I'm Thundercloud, Mum calls me James. Washing away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rains. Did I already say that? Who knows? Who cares? It's the 5th of December today. Yes. And I'm going to record Chilling Tuesday. Chilling Tuesday. <sighs> a lot earlier at the end of a, what's the time? It's 5, 11, 12 hour day instead of a 14 or a 16 hour day, which I often do when I'm very, very tired at the end of. Well, last week I missed out because I was a bit crook, so I didn't get to finish, uh, continue with my Henry Lawson special, which I'm going to tonight. Yeah, that's right, Henry Lawson. The early days from this book here, A Campfire Yarn, Henry Lawson, Completed Works, 1885 to 1900, published by, pretty sure it was Lansdowne Press or something like that. Yeah, Sydney in 1984. But uh, yeah, what I'll be reading out are uh, Henry Lawson's verses from 1890, 1890, as I should say. 1890, yeah, and 1891. Maybe even go into 1892. Depends. No, actually, no, I think I'll be reading 1891. Yeah, anyway, let's Let's get into it, shall we? All right, Henry Lawson. On the Wallaby, that was the first one I was gonna, gonna do for you. Just gotta find it. On the Wallaby by Henry Lawson. Yeah, this is 1891. Now, the tent poles are rotting, the campfires are dead, and um, possums may gamble in trees overhead. I'm humping my bluey far out in, on the land, and the prints of my blutches sink deep in the sand. I'm out on the wallaby humping my drum, and I came by the tracks where the sundowners come. It is nor'west and west are the ranges and far to the plains where the cattle and sheep stations are. With the sky for my roof and the grass for my bunk, and a calico bag for my damper and junk, and scarcely a comrade my memory reveals save the spiritless dingo in tow of my heels. But I think of the honest old lad of my home, when the stars hang in clusters like lamps from the dome, and I think of the hearth where the dark shadows fall and when my campfire is built on the widest of all. But I'm following fate, for I know she knows best. I follow, she leads, and it's nor west by west. When my tent is all torn and my blankets are damp and the flood waters rising flow fast by the camp, when the cold water rises in jets from the floor, I lie on my bunk and I listen to the roar. And I think of how tomorrow my footsteps will lag when I tramp neath the weight of a rain-sodden swag. Though the way of the swagman is mostly uphill, there are joys to be found on the wallaby still when the day has gone by with its tramp or its toil and your campfire you light and your billy you boil. There's comfort and peace in the bowl of your clay or the yarn of a mate who is tramping that way. But beware of the town. There is poison for years in the pleasure you'll find in the depths of long beers. For the bushman gets bushed in the streets of the town where he loses his friend when his check is knocked down. He is right till his pockets are empty and then he can hump his old blue up country again. Yeah, so hump and the bluey because it's usually a blue swag, blue blankets. And uh, the wallaby is the wallaby track. It was basically when you were on the road on, as a swagman or a, a backpacker's the modern version, hitchhiking, I 
guess. Next one. This is called Let the Government Determine and it was published in Boomerang. We have read the country paper by the sunlight and the taper and the burden of the leader lays upon our heart a weight. This, the substance of the sermon, let the government determine that the public time and money isn't wasted on debate. Let it go for irrigation or make easy immigration of desirable and wealthy farmers from across the seas. Open lands to free selection have a moderate protection, thus encouraging the progress of our local industries. Let the government, and so on, that's the way the papers go on, let them go as indicated, but the bother is they don't. That's the path, we always knew it. Why the members don't pursue it is because they're not inclined to, or in short, because they won't. Why? They won't. But it is treason to attempt to give a reason. We're inclined to fancy rather that they've got into a mess. But the pathway would be lighted and the wrongs would all be righted if the government included yours to order. Joseph S. Mm. probably as relevant today in 2023 as it was in 1891, over 132 years ago when it was written. This one's called Harry Stevens, a bit of a tragedy. Harry Stevens, Shearer, discovered lying on a sheet of bark by the Camboon Road with his bluey wrapped around him, dead identified by a union loyalty ticket. Harry Stevens. So, the world of odds and evens ceased to trouble Harry Stevens and the niggard road no longer echoes to his lonely tread. For another bushman found him with his bluey wrapped around him, sleeping like a bushman, only sleeping with the mighty dead. And the shadows were upon him, and they found a ticket on him, just a relic of a battle that was lately lost and won. And it told the stray Cambunian he'd been loyal to his union, right or wrong, he had been loyal to the strike of 91. Next, the beauty and the dude. Beauty and the Dude by Henry Lawson. A fresh, sweet-scented beauty came tripping down the street. She was as fair a vision as you might chance to meet. A masher raised his caddy. I don't want to be rude. He raised it to the lady, that fresh, sweet-scented dude. They met and talked and simpered and giggled in the street. They were as bright a vision as you might wish to meet. I don't know what they're good for, but don't want to be rude to the sweet, fair, sweet-scented beauty or the well-upholstered dude. That was also published in the Boomerang, as was the previous two and as were the previous two and the next one. This one's called Lay Your Ears Back and Fight. When you drink of what the poets rave about as Sora's carp. And your mouth, in spite of laughing, gets a curve the wrong way up. Do not whine or for help or pity. Never cringe at fortune's frown. 
Lay your listeners back and fight until you fight your sorrows down. Though the world on empty pockets is at times a little harsh, and the weights of care are clinging to the ends of your moustache, never let your grief boil over. It is nothing to the town. Lay your listeners back and battle until you fight your sorrows down. When the law of gravitation lays a hand upon your heart and the slings and arrows fetch you and you feel them pretty smart. When you cannot find a billet and you haven't half a crown, lay your listeners back and fight until you fight your sorrows down. When the guilt upon the future wears in places very thin, Look as if there's nothing crooked. Try and summon up a grin. There's a mask that you must always wear the other way about. Lay your listeners back and battle till you knock your sorrows out. Lay your ears back and fight by Henry Lawson. Lovely, lovely poem, really. It's quite, it's a forceful, it's like a fighting, fighting poem, yeah. My Literary Friend, published in Verses Popular and Human, Humorous. Well, look, we've got humorous verses here, actually, by Henry Lawson. Once I wrote a little poem, which I thought was very fine, and I showed the printer's copy to a critic friend of mine. First he praised the little thing, then he found a little fault. The ideas are good, he muttered, but the rhythm seems to hold. So I'd straighten up the rhythm where he'd marked it with his pen and I copied it and showed it to my clever friend again. You've improved the metre greatly, but the rhymes are bad, he said, as he read it slowly, scratching surplus wisdom from his head. So I worked as he suggested, I believe in taking time, and I burnt the midnight taper while I straightened up the rhyme. It is better now, he muttered. You go on and you'll succeed. It has got a ring about it. The ideas are what you need. So I work for hours upon it, I go on when I commence and I kept in view the rhythm and the jingle and the sense and I copied it and took it to my solemn friend once more. But reminded him of something he had read somewhere before. Now, the people say I'd never put such horrors into print if I wasn't too conceited to accept a friendly hint And my dearest friends are certain that I'd profit in the end if I'd always show my copy to a literary friend. Verses popular and humorous. The Literary Friend by Henry Lawson. Oh, this one's great. We've got two poems in, in a row here. The Shame of Going Back and then The Old Man's Welcome. A sequel to The Shame of going back. One of the very interesting thing about Henry Lawson's family, brothers and sisters, his mother Louisa Lawson was a fantastic writer, writer, publisher in her own right. Wrote some fantastic poetry and also ran the dawn and the opened up, bought the Republic magazine and then ran the dawn from about 1890, uh, 1892 or 1880, something around that time, 88, something like that. Anyway, she supported Henry, which in his early days, which is why he went on to become a really good writer. But back to his family, he had three brothers and a sister. And... Mrs Lawson married Mr Lawson and they lived out at uh, Golgong on the uh, gold fields and she always wanted to leave. Anyway, before she left, one of Henry's brothers had a disagreement with Henry's other brother and put a noose around his neck and like threatened to kill him. And then after that, ran away out of shame and... So I I often wonder, and then not like... So this here was written after 
Mrs. Lawson had taken Henry, the sister, and the remaining brother to Sydney. She left her husband at the age she at the age of 37, and with the remaining three children, she travelled to Sydney, and that's when she bought the Dawn and left her husband on the goldfields. He died only a couple of years later. So these two poems that I'm about to read, kind of, I wonder if this is written with reference to Henry's brother that did that. This is called The Shame of Going Back. When you've come to make a fortune and you haven't made your salt, and the reason of your failure isn't anybody's fault, when you haven't got a billet, and the times are very slack, there is nothing that can spur you like the shame of going back. Crawling home with empty pockets, going back hard up, oh, it's then you learn the meaning of humiliation's cup. When the place and you are strangers and you struggle all alone and you haven't mighty longing for a town where you are known, when your clothes are very shabby and the future's very black, there is nothing that can hurt you like the shame of going back. When we've fought the battle bravely and are beaten to the wall, tis the sneers of Men, not conscience, that make cowards of us all. And the while you are returning, oh, your brain is on the rack and your heart is in the shadow of the shame of going back. When a beaten man's discovered with a bullet in his brain, they post-mortem him and try him. And they say he was insane, but it very often happens that he lately got the sack and his onward move was owing to the shame of going back. Ah, my friend, you call it nonsense and your upper lip is curled. I can see that you have never worked your passage through the world but when fortune rounds upon you and the rain is on the track you'll learn the bitter meaning of the shame of going back going home with empty pockets, going home hard up. Oh, you'll taste the bitter poison in humiliation's cup. That's from in the days when the world was wide. A Shame of Going Back by Henry Lawson. And then the old man's Welcome, a sequel to the shame of going back. So, you've been a bit unlucky and you dashed hard up and you blame humiliation and his poison cup and your heart is in a shadow, why, you must be drunk. Light the fire, boil the billy while I fix your bunk. There's very little doing here, but don't you fret. There's plenty junk and damper in the gin case yet. What the devil set you rhyming? You're a damn fool, Jack. Never talk about the sorrow of a coming back. You've had a lot of trouble, but the poem was worst. And you never thought of coming to the old man first? You deserve the frowns of fortune. You deserve your licks if you go without a dinner while the old man kicks. I'm mighty glad to see you, for the boys are gone. And it's lonely in the humpy when the night comes on. There's a pipe and good tobacco on the corner shelf. There's a sprinkle in the bottle. You must help yourself. I'll hunt you up a billet, Jack. But don't forget, there's plenty junk and damper in the din gin case yet. In the bulletin. That's, bu that's a really beautiful, kind of like welcoming, feeling, forgiving poem. There's something really 
wholesome about it. Yeah. Maybe I, I, as I'm delivering it, I'm thinking about my own sons and how, you know, any time they'd always be welcome if they ever got in trouble. Mm, it's actually bringing a bit of a tear to my eye, really. Well, look, I'm up to 1892 now. It's from verses popular and humorous. A dairy on a cove. So I'm not too sure what a dairy or a cove is, but let's go. Twas in the felon's dock he stood, his eyes were black and blue. His voice with grief was broken and his nose was broken too. He muttered that broken nose was, as that broken nose was wiped upon his cap. Oh, it's awful when the police's got a dairy on a chap. I'm an honest working cove, as any bloke can see. It's just because the police has got a dairy, sir, on me. Ah, yes, the legal gents can grin. I say it ain't no joke. It's cruel when the police has got a dairy on a bloke. Why don't I go to work, he said. He muttered, why don't you? Your honour knows as well as me there ain't no work to do. And when I try to find a job, I'm shattered by a trap. It's awful when the police has got a dairy on a chap. I sighed and Shed a tearlet for that noble natured marred. But ah, the bench was rough on him and gave him six months hard. He only said, Beyond the grave you'll cop it hot, by Jove. There ain't no angel police to get a dairy on a cove. Yeah, that's from verses popular and humorous, but I don't know. It doesn't seem really funny when the police have just beaten this fella up. He stood like his voice with grief was broken and his nose was broken too and his eyes were black and blue, you know. And so they've beaten them, everything out of him and then charged him with something and he's obviously got no witnesses so they've just put him in jail for six months because the police have got a dairy on him. A study in the nude, N-O-O-D and I'm not too sure what that means. A sailor named Grice was seen by the guard of a goods train lying close to the railway lying near Warnertown, South Australia, in a nude condition. Here we go. He was unconscious and had lain there three days, during which, during one of which the glass registered 110 in the shade. Grice expressed surprise that the train did not pick him up. Well, that's pretty... Terrible to see someone probably dead. But anyway, here we go. He was bare. We don't want to be rude. His condition was owing to drink. The say his condition was nude, which amounts to the same thing, we think. We meant his condition, we think, was naked, conditional, nude, which amounts to same, the same thing, we think. Uncovered he lay on the grass that shriveled and shrunk and he stayed three hot summer days while the glass was 110 in the shade. We nearly remarked that he laid, but that was bad grammar, we thought. It does sound bucolic, we think. It smacks of the barnyard of farming of pullets, in short. Unheeded, 
He lay in the dirt beside him, a part of his dress, a tattered and threadbare old shirt. He was raised as a flag of distress, on a stick like a flag of distress. Reversed, we mean that the tail end was up, half mast on a stick, an evident flag of distress. Perhaps in his dreams he pursued bright visions of heavenly bliss and the artists who study the nude never saw such a study as this. The luggage went by and the guard looked out and his eyes fell on Grice. We fancy he looked at him hard. We think that he looked at him twice. They say if the telegram's true, when he woke up he wondered, good Lord, why the engine man didn't heave to, why the train didn't take him aboard. And now by the case of Paul Grice, we think that a daily express should travel with sunshades and ice and look out for flags of distress. The love of a God in inverted commas. She stood with the tall painted turrets above her while I lingered and worshipped the boards where she trod from the rose in her hair to her instep. I love her. But what does she care for the love of a god? Ah, bell of the stage, if the gods should forsake you, your bright star would fall like a stone from the sky. You know tis the cheers of their godships that make you, and yet you begrudge them a blink from your eye. While we sit in the darkness and pay you our duty, you give not an that which our worship demands. You have eyes for the dress swell and the beauty who think would be vulgar to clap their white hands. Yet we have romances and we have our trouble. Tis only the stage of our lives is so wide, my queen, I am worthy as gay any gay noble who strutted through Rome with a sword at his side. Yet bless her, God bless her, our fair prima donna, a lily, a daisy, a willow, a rose. And brightly and long may the lime light shine on her, as bell of the ballet wherever she goes. This bell from the crown of her head to her instep I love her with love that shall rest only under the sod. For search through the world and you'll never discover a queen of the footlights in love with a god. From the bulletin. Here we go. We've got a little short one. And then a little quick one and a long one to finish off with when your pants begin to go. But let's begin with... Ned's delicate way. Ned knew I was short of tobacco one day and that I was too proud to ask for it. He hated such pride, but his delicate way forbade him, forbade him to take me to task for it. I loathed to be caging tobacco from Ned, but when I was just in the brink of it, I've got a new brand of tobacco, he said. Try a smoke and let us know what you think of it. And now the last one. When your pants begin to go, but I'm not going to read it yet. Before I go on, look, behind me here is the Australian Poetry Library and Archive. I've been building this for well, well over three years and eight months now. And I've had some fantastic donations. Chrissy from Ballarat, Jeff Doyle, uh, Robin Rowland, and plenty of other people as well as thanks to Rotary Book Fairs and Op Shops and Ross Burnett from Burnett Books in Armadale, uh, in Urella and Badger from Badger's Books in Glen Innes, all of those places. But what I'm, I'm saying here is if you are a poet and you've got poetry books that you've published or a collection or you're a collector of poetry and you are what do they call it, death nesting, downsizing, wanting to make sure that your poetry collection goes to a place where it will be preserved, not just you know, given away to Vinnies or burnt uh, by Vinnies, because often Vinnies and all those op shops do burn their excess books. So 
here you can send it to 144 Bradley Street, Gyra, by mail, the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, and I'll make sure that they go into this Australian Poetry Library and Archive. With some of the one, some of the crackers that I've got here, uh, things like this one here, Australian Poets, 1788 to 1888. That's like the first hundred years of poetry in Australia, and um, and plenty more really kind of rare stuff, one of a kind stuff. Uh, yeah, so if you want to make, you want to donate to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, Poetry Library and Archive, please do. And I will be grateful. And it also means that the cultural heritage of, the literary heritage of Australian poetry is preserved up here in Gyra, where the humidity is low, so the books last a long time, etc., etc. And, you know, books don't begin to go like when your pants begin to go, which I'm just about to read out. All right. What's, what's, what else is coming up? here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Well, every Wednesday night we've got Wednesday Words Open Mic Night. Tonight I'm heading down to Armadale for the Armadale Poetry Night at the Grand Hotel. And that is every first Tuesday of the month there at the Grand Hotel from seven o'clock. So if you live in Armadale and you want to go to a poetry night down there first Tuesday of the month, uh, every Wednesday here in Gyra, Wednesday Words Open Mic and as of well, now, next year, we're going to encourage not just poetry, but also music as well. So if there's any musicians who want to come along and play up on this fantastic stage here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, uh, come along. Wednesday night, 6.30. All right, let's get on to when your pants begin to go. Also, and before I do that, just down below in the, in the description, is the PayPal link, and if you do would like to donate this money to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, it's always appreciated because I've got so much to do here that I would love to do, like big posters of poets and that, so I can expand the Poets Hall of Fame and really celebrate all of our poets. And I can only do that with a, our gen generous donors, like people like Gladys Wilson, etc. All right. When your pants begin to go, from when I was a kid. When you wear a cloudy collar and a shirt that isn't white, and you cannot sleep for thinking how you reach tomorrow night. You may be a man of sorrows and on speaking terms with care, but as yet you're unacquainted with the demon of despair. For I rather think that nothing heaps the trouble on your mind like the knowledge that the trousers badly need a patch behind. I've noticed when misfortune strikes the hero of the play that his clothes are worn and tattered in the most unlikely way. And the gods applaud and cheer him while he whines and loafs around. And they never seem to notice that his pants are mostly sound. But of course, he cannot help it, for our mirth would mock his care if the ceiling of his Trousers showed the patches of repair. You are nonetheless a hero if you elevate your chin when you feel the pavement wearing through the leather sock and skin. You are rather more heroic than are ordinary folk if you scorn to fish for pity under cover of a joke. You'll face the doubtful glances of the people that you know, but of course you're bound to face them when your pants begin to go. If you flush, you look, took your pleasures, failed to make a god of pelf. Some will say that for your troubles, you can only thank yourself. Some will swear you'll die a beggar, but you'll laugh at that. While your garments hang together and you wear a decent hat, you may laugh at their predictions while your souls are wearing low. But... A man's an awful coward when his pants begin to go. Though the present and the future may be anything but bright, it is best to tell the fellows that you're getting on all right. And a man prefers to say it. Tis a manly lie to tell, for the folks may be persuaded that you're doing very well. But it's hard to be a hero. It's hard to wear a grin. 
when your most important garment is in places very thin? Get some sympathy and comfort from the chum who knows you best, that your sorrows won't run over in the presence of the rest. There's a chum that you can go to when you're feeling inclined to whine. He'll declare your coat is tidy and he'll say, just look at mine. Though you may be patched all over, he will say it doesn't show. He'll swear it can't be noticed when your pants begin to go. Brother mine and of misfortune, times are hard, but do not fret. Keep your courage up and struggle and we'll laugh at these things yet. Though there is no corn in Egypt, surely Africa has some. Keep your smile in working order for the better days to come. We will often laugh together at the hard times that we know and get measured by the tailor when our pants begin to go. Now, the lady of refinement in the lap of comfort rocked, chancing on these rugged verses, will pretend that she's shot. Leave her to her smelling bottle, tis the wealthy who decide that the world should hide its patches neath the cruel cloak of pride. And I think there's something noble, and I'll swear there's nothing low in the pride of human nature when its pants begin to go. From when I was king by Henry Lawson. All right, well, that's it. Chillin' Tuesday is over. I'm Thundercloud, washing away the garbage, leaving behind rainbows. I will see you next Tuesday. Goodbye.